welcome to the BNP Paribas Asset Management Talking Heads podcast. I'm Daniel Morris, Chief Market Strategist, and today I'm joined by Maya Bandari, Global Head of Multi-Asset, and we'll be discussing the challenging times we're living in today. Clearly, Maya, one can't stay passive in all of this. So what have you done? How have you reacted to the unfolding events? In the last few weeks, as, as geopolitical tensions uh, between uh, Russia and Ukraine have continued uh, to escalate uh, meaningfully in, in a highly unpredictable manner, uh, as you reflect, uh, Dan, uh, I would say we've taken uh, really uh, three uh, chief actions. Uh, first, uh, in the very early days uh, of the conflict uh, on the 23rd of February, uh, to be precise, uh, we took advantage uh, of the many rally uh, inequities on, on the prospect of uh, soft global sanctions uh, to protect portfolios uh, from further geopolitical shocks. Um, so we reduced our, our risk taking or, or tracking errors right down to the cusp of uh, neutrality uh, and greater caution. Uh, and we achieved this uh, by, by really halving uh, our tactical uh, risk positions uh, towards both uh, European uh, equities uh, and emerging market equities uh, and, and moved uh, into cash. And, and as a result, we lowered both regions uh, to neutral uh, in our sort of risk adjusted view uh, of the world. Uh, earlier this week, uh, when we saw a very significant rally in European equities, uh, we, we closed our, our tactical European equities position entirely, uh, leaving uh, really our main equity exposure today uh, in Japan, uh, which is cash rich, uh, relatively attractively valued, supported by local policy, and we feel uh, fairly isolated uh, from, from the ongoing conflict. Uh, and we are long yen against this as well, which has offered us some protection uh, in, in weak and, and volatile markets. Volatility isn't necessarily a bad thing uh, for, for active uh, asset managers uh, from a multi-asset perspective. Um, you know, vol market volatility allowed us to close off uh, European equities at a, at, a, at a more attractive uh, price than we might have got uh, without that volatility. And, and likewise, we had the opportunity to deepen our duration shorts at more attractive levels uh, than those that we have uh, today, for example. We are running high cash. Uh, all the changes I've reflected so far have gone straight into cash. We haven't invested it uh, elsewhere. And that really reflects the belief that that is the most effective buffer uh, in, in current circumstances. Circumstances. Uh, but just to pick up on, on some of those uh, liquidity challenges, uh, uh, not being uh, only, only in credit, which of course it can often give us a lead uh, uh, to other asset classes on, on underlying uh, liquidity conditions. Uh, you know, I mentioned we, uh, we, we halved our commodity exposures. Uh, you know, we had um, our, our tactical commodity um, uh, exposures are taken via very liquid ETFs. Uh, but the bid offers on those uh, were, you know, uh, up to up to three percent uh, on the halting of uh, of nickel trading uh, by by the LME. So, so you know, across asset classes, I think we're seeing uh, uh, we're seeing uh, fairly challenging uh, um, liquidity conditions. Let's talk a little bit about equity styles, uh, if we may. I think we appreciate that the story uh, prior to the crisis was very much uh, the rotation away from growth towards value. Uh, now, this kind of half continued because you've had commodities do well, but uh, on the other hand, financials have, have not done so well. Uh, has uh, the recent events, has that changed your expectations for relative performance, growth and value? Is there going to be a differentiation uh, within growth, uh, types of growth or regions? So I'm just curious. Uh, in what way, if at all, uh, things have changed? The discount rate, uh, if you will, for, for equities has, have, has fallen very sharply. Uh, so if I look in Europe, for example, uh, weighted by GDP, real yields are, are, are about 350 basis points lower than they were uh, in 2011 uh, when oil prices uh, were last at these levels. Uh, if I look at the US, uh, you know, forward rate, real rates are, you know, 100, 125 basis points lower. Uh, than they were at a time associated with secular stagnation, which I would say was a fairly downbeat uh, assessment uh, of the global uh, economy. Uh, now, perhaps threading this uh, to equities, uh, perhaps one reason that growth hasn't done better, maybe that others uh, like us uh, uh, expect uh, further movements, uh, significant moves uh, in, in real yields or, or discount rates uh, more broadly as, as central banks respond to significant uh, underlying uh, inflation pressures, which long duration growth stocks broadly, and broadly is important here because it's the broad picture that I'm speaking of, uh, are, are particularly vulnerable. And 
And I think it's fair to say that, you know, again, broadly, uh, growth stocks uh, have enjoyed a fairly unusual sweet spot uh, in recent years. You know, the discount rate uh, applied to future cash flows uh, has been anchored ever lower uh, by real yields, uh, while, while cash flows have been boosted uh, hitherto by, by rising uh, break-evens. Another way of putting this uh, is that the two chief drivers of, of most, not all, but most asset market returns cash flows and discount rates uh, have been very, very positive uh, uh, for growth stocks. Uh, and I guess some of the shifts uh, in those in those drivers comes at a time when valuations are broadly are pretty full. Uh, so uh, while the Nasdaq, uh, for instance, uh, has derated by 22, 23 percent uh, this year on, on, on forward multiples, uh, you know, it's still in the top third uh, of its valuation range over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, a similar story, uh, I would say, for, for growth more broadly right now. So, you know, the 12 month forward price to earnings ratio is about 24 times. The average is closer to 19. So, you know, you are, there is still a premium in there. Uh, to be clear, though, um, should growth uh, become more scarce and stable growth uh, does become a, a lot more uh, attractive and within those uh, those broad brushes uh, of sort of growth versus value, uh, there are there are clear uh, opportunities uh, emerging emerging from the bottom up. Uh, like I think when we uh, look at emerging market equities on one hand, and, and we see what's happening uh, certainly with inflation, uh, and particularly with commodities, arguably beneficial for emerging market LATAM, EMEA, ex-Russia, uh, and perhaps not so positive for Asia, where you tend to be commodity importers. Uh, so Maya, uh, kind of what your view is, uh, expectations are for emerging market equities? Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, the, the surge in commodities like we've seen, so fairly broad based across energy and food, I would say is actually more challenging uh, for EMs broadly because food and energy are such big parts of, of consumption, uh, uh, both in LATAM and, and uh, in, in Asia and, and SAMEA. So we don't have the same uh, core versus headline uh, component as we do uh, in developed markets. And uh, inflation expectations are more easily easily unanchored uh, by current inflation perhaps than we than we see uh, in in the west so i would say perhaps a more challenging setup uh, than we saw at the start of the year uh, but that is counterbalanced by uh, uh, to a degree by the fact that em central banks were in a way uh, quite considerably ahead of the curve relative to developed markets uh, hiking uh, through uh, through much of, of last year uh, now, uh, emerging market equities are, are, are certainly interesting. They're an area that we had favoured uh, until uh, late uh, February uh, when we tactically uh, clipped uh, back um, uh, emerging markets along with, uh, with Europe seeking to reduce our risk. Uh, now, the motivation for, for clipping back emerging markets was that uh, they had held up uh, rather well, at least until the, the 23rd of February or so, uh, remain quite vulnerable to the disruption uh, uh, from both energy and indeed uh, food prices. Uh, and there was, you know, there, there were some uh, risks, uh, if you will, to watch around uh, China's uh, posturing, uh, both around uh, policy more broadly uh, and indeed uh, around, around the conflict. So these, but these were strongly tactical moves. Uh, seeking to reduce risk uh, at the very start of this conflict. Uh, when I look today, I would say EM um, uh, sort of sits alongside uh, Japan as being uh, attractively uh, valued. Uh, and at least in China, uh, and this is quite important, policy is pulling in the opposite direction uh, to, to develop markets, uh, which is also supportive. I mean, you know, I guess China started pulling in the opposite direction uh, a year ago uh, when developed markets uh, continued uh, to ease and China very much decided not to, thereby delivering uh, tightening in relative terms versus the rest of the world. Uh, this year, it's seeking to unwind some of that, uh, which uh, um, is is uh, positive uh, for uh, certainly for some of the riskier uh, EM assets. So I think we have uh, time for a lightning round question. So just a quick response on your highest conviction view right now. Well, from a multi-asset standpoint, uh, highest conviction view is being uh, short duration. Uh, I guess in addition to what we've already discussed, um, uh, I might add that, you know, from a purely multi-asset perspective, uh, you know, I, I think um, we question the role of government bonds as a source of diversification. You know, the nice thing about a bond is you're shown what you'll be paid. Uh, the not so nice thing is a one and a half, two, even two and a half percent. That's that's not a huge amount of of, of a, a protection uh, that, that that you're getting. And as we've discussed, I think you know many of the ingredients 
uh, for higher bond deals uh, are, are very much uh, here. You know, we've had a, a an oil shock overlaid upon a larger and longer lasting inflation shock from, from COVID-19, acute labor market shortages, large scale stimulus rolling back faster uh, than expected uh, and, uh, and so on. So uh, being short duration, I think, would be the highest uh, conviction view right now if I had one view that I could share. Well, that's all we have time for today. If you'd like more information, please reach out to your BNP Paribas Asset Management contact or check out our Investors Corner blog. For listeners who have devices with Alexa, you can ask Alexa to enable Investment Insights or search for Investment Insights on Amazon under the category Alexa Skills. My thanks to Maya for sharing her insights. Please join me next week when I'll be speaking with Chi Lo about all that's happening in China. Until then, we hope you stay safe and take care. This podcast presentation includes a discussion on current market events and is not intended as investment advice or an offer of products or services by BMP Paribas Asset Management. Please keep in mind that the information and analysis in this presentation is only current as of the publication date.